Howdy everyone, my name is Griffin Furlong. I'm a professional engineer in the state of Florida and you are tuning in to the land development series. We've gone through a lot of different aspects like due diligence and pre-development models and now we're going to start making our way into site planning. Because once we actually develop the site plan, then we can nail down more of the infrastructure design such as the storm sewer and sanitary and then all of the utilities. In this specific video, you're going to learn the major constraints that factor into site planning to get a project going from property boundary to looking like this that we see on the screen here. Now the couple points I want to make before we even start is that number one, no project is the same. Number two, every land development code is different. It really depends where you are developing your property, whether you're in Kansas or Florida or New York, even different counties within a state vary on the regulations. Of Without further ado, let's dive right into it. All right, so here we are looking at a property that we have. It looks like we have some existing ponds and existing wetlands. And if you've tuned into the last videos, you know exactly the site that we're dealing with. So if you haven't checked out those videos, I would highly suggest you go backwards here. Now, what we're trying to do here is determine how we can develop this piece of land and how we can actually site plan it to get the exact product that we want. Now, with this example, we're going through a residential project, not a commercial project. So residential and commercial projects will vary significantly with your goal and especially like the amount of area. I mean, this is a really big property where we're trying to build over a hundred units. So that's just one little caveat here. Now here we're going to walk through the key constraints. So key constraint number one is the property boundary. You have to have a sign and sealed boundary survey of the property. And this sign and sealed boundary survey has to be from a licensed surveyor. Now these are really key words, sign and sealed and licensed surveyor. You'd be surprised. There is a ton of litigation that can happen if you're getting random surveys from a non-licensed surveyor. Also, there's a ton of litigation that can happen if you aren't working with a real established boundary. Now, what does that even look like? So how would you even get this property boundary in the first place? Well, one way that you could at least get, let's say, a dummy line or just a little parcel line to deal with and site plan with, you can get those from a county GIS website. So sometimes a county will have a parcel map and you can go online, it's public information, you can go in and you can download the shapefile. Now it doesn't mean that that's the legitimate property boundary. So you can get into really big trouble if you don't have the right line. Now in order to actually get a real property line, you need to hire a surveyor. A surveyor will dive in through public records, they'll go out to the site and identify monuments, they'll verify that the boundary closes, and at the end of the day, you'll get a sign and sealed boundary survey. So that is critical, that is step one. The number two biggest constraint in site planning is buffers and setbacks. Now, what are buffers and setbacks? So think of a buffer as a buffer of area between your property boundary and where your developable area is going to be. Let's just say, for instance, let's say we had a neighborhood right here and there was a particular buffer requirement of the land development code. And we're going to dive just right into that in a second. Let's say the land development code required you to have a minimum 20 foot wide buffer from this residential neighborhood. Well, you would be required to do an offset from this boundary line inwards into your property and you would have to meet the particular requirements of the land development code. For instance, a lot of these buffers are typically landscape buffers where you're doing landscape plantings. You might have to build a fence or a wall. So usually when you're starting out with this project, you're working together with a landscape architect or a planner to help you understand what type of buffer setback requirements are within the property. In order to actually get this land development code, you can go to Municode. We happen to just be using Pasco County, which is a county in Florida, and you can dive in through the different chapters of the land development code to find out all of the, the requirements that you need to create a site plan. Now, if you've never heard of zoning before, there are typical zoning standards. So what is zoning? Think of zoning as the county or the city identifying pieces of property, typically large amounts of property, 
that are going to be zoned for a specific use. This is a way for the city or county to organize pieces of property. So for instance, you can have a zoned agricultural district. So in this agricultural district, there's gonna be a particular section of land where you can only do agricultural operations. Also, you can have a zone of residential. So they're saying that this much area here, this colorful big boundary, you can only develop residential neighborhoods or lots. And then you also have commercial districts. So if a property is zoned commercial, you can build a commercial product, like let's say an auto zone or a Walgreens or a Walmart. So this is a way for planners of the city or the county to strategize how the land is going to be used. Now the reason why this is important and the, why you should pay attention to this is because zoning comes up every time during this development process. You'll always have to go back to the zoning standards of the property. There's going to be particular items that you need in order to develop your site plan, which is exactly what I was talking about, like buffers and setback requirements. And then now we're about to get into the third topic, which is Typical zoning standards for your property, this happens to be uh, zoned as an MPUD, which is a master plan unit development, meaning we've kind of coordinated with the county to develop our own standards for the property that the developer and the county agree upon. So if I scroll down to this land development code, it looks like there's an MPUD, master plan development district, and there's a lot of legal language in here, but there's also a lot of different codes. And it's the job of the civil engineer and the planner to hash out and make sure you understand all of the different requirements. So when you walk through this land development code, I mean, you're going to have certain floor area requirements. You're going to have a certain amount of building area that you can even build on a property, certain amount of lots. So let's say with our example of this residential neighborhood, there's going to be a specific amount of lots we can develop. And again, this is decided by the jurisdiction that you're in. So we've gone through property boundary, buffers, setbacks, kind of touched on density. Then now there's a couple more. So another one is open space requirements. So a lot of counties have open space requirements. What is open space? Well, every county can be different with what open space means. Some counties will even say that wetlands and ponds count as open space. But generally speaking, open space is just green area. So like fields, grass, sodded areas. The reason for this is because with these developments, stormwater is always a huge deal. The more impervious area that we place on our site plan, the quicker water is going to run off. And we as a civil engineer have to develop the stormwater infrastructure to make sure that we're not causing any downstream impacts or flooding within the property. And I know you guys are probably watching this and are like, man, this is just a lot of words and regulations, but this is part of the job as a land development engineer. If you don't develop this checklist, you may end up making a costly mistake. Because let's say you overlooked a setback or a buffer, or maybe you overlooked a piece of the code and you begin doing all of your site plan, you work it out with the client, and months later you design this whole project realizing that you couldn't do something, well, you just costed the client thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars, and then now the client's looking at you like you're done. Okay, on to number four, right-of-way requirements. So I'm going to flash on my screen some of the right-of-way. And again, we are going to have a video where we are laying these out and doing other cross sections, but I wanted to show you all of the different constraints of the site. So here I'm flashing the right of way of the site. Right of way is a right of way for people to drive their cars, walk on the sidewalk. It's a legal designated area of land where people can do such. Now in the land development code, there are particular minimum right-of-way widths that you need. So where do you find this? Well, you find it in the land development code. So it looks like, you know, as an example, a type 4 road, type 4 streets are streets providing two through lanes, usually serve as cul-de-sacs. So these are typically your little cul-de-sac streets. So your type 4 equivalent residential unit served is typically 50 or less. So that's for like those little uh, cul-de-sacs. So maybe, you know, if we go back to the site plan, this is one of those cul-de-sac roads. Now, if this is serving less than 50 people, then this would be the type four road. So let's dig deeper 
to what this type four road means. It shows you your pavement width. So depending on the street type, you know, you have to consult with your client if you're trying to provide parking on one side or parking on both sides, because it looks like it impacts your right of way. But I know in this case, when we're designing, we've talked to the client, we're not trying to have parking along, along the road. So a street type four without parking in the urban environment is a standard 50 feet. So in this case, that is a constraint that we check the box off of. We know that we have to develop 50 feet of right of way here for this cul-de-sac. Now we have to do the same thing for all of these other bits of right of ways because perhaps some of these will end up being less right of way depending on the standards. I hope that makes sense and I hope that you've learned a little bit more about what right of way means. I know that there's a lot of terminology that I was learning when I was an intern, whether it was easement, right of way. Now an easement is an area of land that has an agreement associated to it. So someone can do whatever they want within that agreement, within the bounds of a legal document, you know, within that easement area. So for instance, a lot of times easements are granted, like let's say, uh, a power company really needed a pole on site because people have to have power. So, you know, there is an easement agreement between two parties, which is the property owner and the person that needs the easement. They form an agreement and the easement's created. So we happen to have an easement running through this property. So that is actually one constraint that you have to be aware of. Are there any existing easements? Now, how do you find existing easements? It goes back to that step one of working with your surveyor on a property boundary and to also work with your client to see if they did an Alta survey. Now an Alta survey is an American Land Title Association. So now what an Alta survey does is tells you a little bit more details about your property. It will list all of the encumbrances and easements associated. So let's say if you get an Alta survey, I would have gotten information regarding this easement here on the west side of my property. So that's another step that you have to take. What you might hear clients say or developers say is pulling title. So you're pulling title of a property so you're getting all of this property information. Now one thing that I brushed on were setbacks early on but I wanted to kind of highlight that. So we have this huge wetland here in the middle and this wetland line was established by an environmental scientist who went out there and investigated the wetland and marked particular points of the wetland. These points were staked and then picked up by a surveyor and this ultimately became a protected area. Now these wetlands in Florida typically have required setbacks established by the water management districts of Florida. So there's particular setbacks that we have to meet or sometimes they call them buffers and there's only particular things that you can do within the buffer. Ideally, Ideally, you stay out of the buffer, you protect the wetland, but sometimes you're allowed to grade within the buffer, and sometimes you can impact wetlands, but this requires mitigation and a little bit more permitting. Now, we've gone over some really, really good key constraints when you're developing a site plan. I mean, I could probably go on for more hours, but at the end of the day, you're going to have to consult with your land development code and your planner on the type of constraints. These are the major constraints that we typically see in the field. Now there's just one last constraint. The last constraint is physical land features. Physical land features being the topography of the site or maybe existing rivers, ponds, wetlands, creeks, canals, mountains. Also protected environmental areas like I was talking about with this wetland. If we have to stay out of that wetland, well now it has become a constraint. We can't just build all of our lots within the wetland. You're gonna get some angry people and you're gonna be destroying the environment. Also another factor are existing structures. Let's say there, are, if there are existing structures, let's say within easements like, you know, Know, light poles that can't be taken down or maybe existing buildings that can't be taken down well those impact your site plan and you need to know about those topography plays a critical role because we are held within the bounds of our property we can't grade or fill any portion of property outside of ours. We can't build anything outside of ours or else we need an easement or an agreement with the landowner on the other side. Topography plays a critical role because we have to provide enough space to actually grade down and match the existing grade at our property line. Now, we're gonna touch on that way more in part two. Part two is gonna be 
all about actually diving in and creating the site plan. This episode was really to show you all of the major constraints that a civil engineer and planner are thinking about during this process. I hope you learned something new. If you haven't checked out any of the other land development series, I highly suggest you check it out. We've already dove into due diligence, pre-development runoff rates, and then now we're gonna be diving a little bit more into the site planning and the actual design of a site. Feel free to drop a comment below if you have any questions. I typically answer every single question, so hit me up and hope to see you guys in the next video. Peace out.